So uh, now we are uh, actually finally into the core concepts of continuum mechanics. And last time we started talking about configuration and motion. And let me redraw the classical, uh, classical um, picture that we're going to see a lot. And just for one more time, I'm going to also um, draw a body. So remember, the body is a collection of uh, particles. So it's really just sort of a, a page which contains a list of these particles. I also assign it <coughs> some sort of domain, it seems. But really, it's just some sort of set. It has no uh, geometrical shape. Uh, but um, if we would like to track the motion of the particles of a body, this is sort of a conceptually nice. And it's certainly a, a setting that has some advantages and makes certain definitions very clear. You will see. So it's nice to have this body concept. But in practice, what we would like to do is we'd like to have a more practical setting where we can track the motion and deformation of a body uh, easily. So instead of referring to the particles of the body with labels uh, m, let's say, what we do is we associate uh, with each particle at a given time, let's say initial time, um, we associate a position and we call that position um, capital X. And this capital X is with respect to some observer uh, that is appropriately chosen. And if I do this for every particle in the body, what I will obtain is a geometrical, um, uh, let me say, uh, assignment to this abstract concept. And this is called A configuration. Um, and this is, in particular, the reference configuration. The reference configuration does not depend on time. At a given time, for us, or it doesn't have to even correspond to some uh, geometrical or spatial uh, region that the body occupied at any given time. But for us, often, it will be the initial configuration of the object, in particular for solid materials. And so this configuration will not depend on time. And that's something we have to keep in mind. So this position vector is independent of time. This is, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between every capital X and the particles of the body. So of course, afterwards, what's going to happen is uh, these particles are going to move. And they are going to occupy a new position in space. And we can call these small x. And these small x, these, these, these vectors point at a point in the Euclidean vector space. So at a given time, this particle happens to be here. But a little bit time later, this particle is going to move on and occupy a different position. Okay? So if you want to track the particle, you have to track it with a motion function that for a given particle referential position, at any given time, it gives you the current position. And at a given time, it happens to overlap with a position vector small x in the Euclidean uh, vector space. Okay? And if you, do this, if you do this tracking for all the particles of the body, then you will obtain the new geometrical shape of the body. So this is, in particular, the motion map that we are interested in. So when I say the motion, this is the vectorial function that I'm really referring to. But on the, um, on the background, there are two other ones. One of them is this. So at a given reference time for the given particle, it gives you the referential position. Or you may want to track the motion of the particles directly in terms of the particle labels. That's an alternative. And then we could perhaps write something like this. Okay? But the reference and the time-wise evolving configuration, the spatial or the current configuration, is what we are interested in. So these are the two configurations that I'm going to draw again and again. OK, and what we talked about also is that we like to keep track of what belongs to the ref or what lives in the referential configuration or what lives in the current spatial configuration. And for that, we prefer to use two different sets of basis vectors that explicitly denote the configuration to which a vectorial entity uh, belongs to. Okay? So capital EA have to do with the referential, and small EI have to do with the current or spatial um, configuration. Okay. 
Um, so then when I talk about the velocity, what I understand is that I want to talk about the velocity of a material point, and I have the motion map. And what I really want to do is I want to keep the particle fixed. So for the same particle, I keep track of rate of change of position with time. So it's sort of a partial derivative uh, while keeping the particle label fixed, and that gives me what the velocity is. So this is where, for instance, um, the existence of this body concept is useful. It clarifies, it makes, states very clearly what we mean by this operation. But now, in practice, what you can also do is you can take a time derivative with respect to the alternative representation where you say, again, I'm keeping the particle fixed, but instead of referring to the particle with its label, you refer to it with its referential position, capital X. Really, they will eventually give you the same thing. OK, so now this, well, at one shot, I've given a short review. And additionally, I've sort of mentioned or uh, restated the existence of these multiple um, representations of a function, in this case, a particular one, the motion function. Okay? But this kind of representation, alternative representations, exists actually for, in principle, any function. And that brings us to Lagrangian and Eulerian representations. So let me give you a very uh, um, simple example to highlight the importance of being careful with the representation of a function. So the very simple example is a function f. And I like to write this as a function of some variable x. And that function is 2x squared. Okay. Um, so the function it's eventually perhaps a physical entity, so it will have a physical value. Let's say at a given position, and the position in this case, let's say, is in terms of uh, some units that are indicated with uh, x. Okay? So these are our coordinates with respect to some units. And at a given position, I have, a, let's say, a certain temperature. right? So this is physical. It has, at a given point, a certain value, but now, that value, function-wise, is represented like this if the coordinates with respect to a certain unit system is expressed with x, and therefore the function, it turns out, is like this. Okay? So now if I change my unit system, it's still going to give me the coordinates, but it's going to give me the coordinates in terms of a different variable because the units are now different. And now let me say that the change of uh, units is such that I'm making up or the change of variables simply, is simply I define a new variable y, and that's equal to x squared. And now I would like to write f as a function of this new coordinate. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to explicitly highlight that now this alternative representation is in terms of not x, but rather y. To highlight that, I'm going to use a different notation on the function. So this represents with respect to which variable I'm writing the function. And so if I make this change of variables, I will have 2y. Now, it's just very conceptual at this stage, but immediately it has a uh, practical implication. And the practical implication is the following. Suppose I would like to evaluate the function. In other words, let's say the temperature at a given point. And you're saying that my coordinates, for instance, are uh, given in terms of x, and x is equal to 2. Okay. So you go ahead and you substitute f hat equals x at 2 to x equal to 8, right? It's equal to 8. Now, on the other hand, if you would like to work in terms of y, what you have to do is into f hat, you don't also plug in 2, but rather it's a function of variable y. So you go ahead, make your change of variables, and you plug in 4. And then, of course, it will still give you 2, 4 equals 8, because a function has a physical value, and that value has to be captured with, sorry, with one or the other representation. 
Now, the practical reason why I am distinguishing between the two representations explicitly is so that we understand which variable is going into this function, right? So in other words, I don't want to make the mistake that, for instance, right? You don't take a variable x and plug it into a representation that it does not belong to. It has to be evaluated using coordinates that it intrinsically contains, right? So now, for this reason, it's convenient whenever we talk about a function, the function, it can be a scalar, vector, or tensor-valued function. It turns out it will have multiple representations. And it's useful without explicitly indicating the variable dependence within a parenthesis, let's say, to explicitly distinguish them with some additional uh, a notation. Okay? Um, right. So in general, in our case, a function may have different representations. Um, remember that in the end, the function has, at a given point, um, at a given time, a certain value. It's going to correspond to some physical entity. What changes is your expression of that function. And the fundamental expression is in terms of the labels of the particles, so using the body concept. And that function, I'm not going to use a lot, but when I do, I'm going to use the check. So phi check, when you see that function, it means it in general depends on time, but I identify the particle with explicitly its label. So that's one representation. The other representation is in terms of capital X. Okay? So now this function will be form-wise. So this is already abstract, but let's say form-wise, still different from the first one because it's now um, a case where the particle is identified with this referential position. So now I'm indicating the, that function with a different um, a symbol. In this case, it's phi hat. Okay, so in practice, and there is going to be yet another one, therefore, as you can imagine, a representation in terms of uh, the spatial position and time, phi tilde of xd. These are all different representations of the same physical entity. Let me quickly tell you how one would read these functions verbally. Okay. Uh, so phi hat, how do I use phi hat? Okay, so what phi hat tells us is that I like to learn the physical value of this function phi. Um, and I like to do this for a given particle. goes without saying at a given time. Okay? The time is the variable that's common to all of them. Okay? I'm not going to write that explicitly. So that's what phi hat does. You give me the label of the particle, I plug it into this function, and this function for that particle, particular, uh, particle m at a given time will give me the value of phi. Okay? The second representation is phi hat. Phi hat um, will tell us, so Imagine I repeat all of this once again. So when I put these, I mean I'm recording. Okay. We record the value of phi for a given particle m. Okay. But the m is not what goes into the function. What goes into the function is capital X. So we want to record the value of phi for a given particle m that is associated with the referential position x. Okay. That is associated or labeled, if you like, with capital X. And now the last one is, again, slightly different. Again, we'd like to do the same thing. We'd like to record the value of phi for a given particle m, 
but we know that a given particle at given different times will occupy different positions, small x. So when I choose x, really, what I'm doing is I'm recording the value of phi for a particle m that happens to be at the spatial position x at that given time. Because a little bit time later, there's going to be a different particle there. If I want to track the same particle, it's going to move to a different position. Right? Conceptually, there's a slight difference. So that happens to be at <coughs> x at time t. Or sometimes maybe a nice word is occupy, OK? It's right. So, so um, right. So the first two give you. You want to talk about a particle, um, then it's easily identified with its label or its referential position. You plug them into these. Either one of these representations will give you the value of phi for that given particle at a given time. This one is a bit more tricky. If you want to directly work in terms of this representation, if you choose a certain x. It seems you have no direct control over the particle that you're choosing. There happens to be a certain particle there, and you're reading the value of phi for that particle. Now, of course, on the background, you know that there is a motion. In other words, if you really want to use that representation and you want to work with a particular choice of the particle, you can choose your particle, find its current spatial position, take that position and put it into this representation and make sure that with that representation you are picking the value for that particle at a given time. Yeah. So you can track one point um, through this uh, representation or you can know the position of a point um, after some time. But you cannot do like the whole thing. Say again. So you cannot like know the position of all the points after some time. That's my question. Can you know the position of all, like the, this, the small x vector for all the points after some time? Oh, so, so the question is, and now I'm repeating because it turns out in the uh, video recording the questions don't always come through clearly. So the question is, can I, what is the reason behind these different representations in some sense, right? So um, your question was, do I? know the position of every particle at a given time. Um, so in other words, do I know exactly what this spatial configuration is so that I can go ahead and make use of this representation? Perhaps is that the question? The answer roughly is yes. Eventually, uh, this motion function might not be a simple one, okay? But there eventually, and, and it may not even be analytically representable in some closed form, function form, um, but, but it turns out we can calculate it at least numerically. And because we can calculate it, we can implicitly eventually make use of this representation as well. Okay? Let me proceed a little bit and let's see how the slight differences in these representations come through when we want to calculate certain quantities. Okay? Uh, but at this point, let me give these representations names. This here is called, and let me highlight with a different color, this is called the material representation. Uh, this is called the Lagrangian or referential representation. Okay. And as you can imagine, this one has to do with the spatial configuration, spatial Representation is one name. The other name is the Eulerian representation. And if you've ever taken a fluid dynamics course, you will immediately recognize the name of that representation. OK, um, okay. so let's move on a little bit and work with these um, quantities and see why it's important to distinguish between these representations. And the first concept that's going to make use of those different representations is the material time derivative. 
Material time derivative, it is a derivative with respect to time. And I'm going to denote it like this. So when you see this, um, uh, this, this notation, you should understand that I'm talking about the material time derivative. And another way I will denote it is phi dot. So phi dot means for us, I'm trying to evaluate the material time derivative. And what is the definition? The definition is that you would like to calculate the rate of change. Okay. So I put it first in words. So why don't you have a look here? Have a, have a look here for a second, and then you can write down. The definition is I'd like to track the rate of change of the function phi with time for a given particle. Okay? That's the definition. I want to keep the particle fixed okay? because the particle will move through space. Okay? And as it moves through space, there is a field of this function, like, like say a temperature. And because it's moving through space, it's going to experience different values of the temperature as it moves through this room. Now, and therefore it will feel as particular temperature change. Now, it doesn't mean that the temperature only changes with position. If the point does not move through the room, at a given point, the temperature might also be changing. It might be increasing, decreasing. So the point-wise, there is a variation of the temperature. And also because of the motion of the material point that I'm talking about, because of the fact that the object is moving, um, also there's a change in the value of the function. The definition says that um, I'm keeping the particle fixed. Okay? And how do I embed that into a functional form? Well, my material representation gives me a very clear indication of how I'm supposed to calculate it. It's a partial derivative of phi check. Because phi hat is explicit in terms of the material label, I keep the particle fixed means I keep the particle label fixed. And so it's very straightforward. Okay. So it's del phi hat m t over del t. So why partial? Because I'm saying I'm keeping m fixed. Okay. Now, you want to keep the particle fixed? Well, there's another way to do it. And that is easily done using the Referential representation as well. So what you can do is you can do a partial derivative on phi hat because phi hat is explicit in terms of the referential position of the particle. There is a unique association between M and capital X. So that's also a partial derivative. And here what I'm doing is I'm keeping the referential position and hence indirectly the particle fixed. Okay? Now, here comes now the tricky part, right? Now, if I want to calculate it in terms of the Eulerian or spatial representation, I better be very careful because let's do it explicitly like this. If I do this alone, okay, just like I did in the first two, what it will do is it will take the Eulerian representation it will take a partial derivative with respect to time. But what it's doing is it's keeping the point in space constant. In other words, this term <coughs> is only going to monitor the rate of change of phi at a given position in space. But at a given position, there appears different particles at different times. The, part, the body is moving through space. Okay? So it's not calculating the correct thing. What I mean, the definition, is that I should keep the particle fixed. So as I take this derivative, I better track the particle. So in other words, I better take into account the fact that at a given time, the particle sort of samples the rate of change of the function at a given position, but the particle also senses that the value of the function is changing as it is traveling through space. So there should be an additional term that comes into play, and that comes in through a gradient. Okay. Dx dt. Okay. And this I will simply refer to as del phi tilde del t. This one is nothing but gradient of phi. Which gradient? The spatial gradient dotted with, this is nothing but the velocity vector. You're tracking the position of a given particle 
rate of change with respect to time, that's the velocity. Okay. Now notice that this is actually nothing but the absolute time derivative with respect to time. It's actually not too fancy. Now when I put it into words, it's important that we, we, that we interpret what we're calculating correctly, the individual contributions. But math-wise, it's really straightforward, right? So I have a function, okay? It's represented in terms of two variables. But now, let us think for a second that I rewrite this function as follows. It is phi tilde of x of t. Now, I haven't yet made any change of variables, so I'm just going to write the representation for x in there. x, if I want to keep tracking the same particle, if that is my goal, instead of x, I'm going to put in the motion function in terms of the referential position, let's say, and time. Okay. So now, if you would like to calculate the absolute time derivative of phi tilde, you have to take first a derivative with respect to the absolute, the explicit appearance of time, this part. And that's what the first term does. But then you realize that the first argument of the function also depends implicitly on time. And therefore, you have to take the derivative of this function with respect to this variable, the first argument, dotted with the rate of change of that argument with respect to the variable with respect to which you are taking the absolute derivative. That's nothing but uh, the absolute time derivative in that sense. Okay? So, but the interpretation was already given. Let me write that explicitly. So in summary, we have um, phi dot, and now we know what we mean by it. So it's the material time derivative. And if you'd like to calculate it in practice, perhaps this is one form that you would prefer, the referential form. And in terms of the um, Spatial representation, that is the last part. So if we look at these two terms that appear in the spatial part, I have the um, interpretations that I already stated. This one is called often the spatial or local um, time derivative. And this one is called the convective time derivative or rate of change, let's say. And what the first term does is it monitors the rate of change right, um, of phi at a fixed point in the Euclidean space. Right? Epsilon was the Euclidean uh, space at time t. Okay. And the second term is monitoring the rate of change of the function <coughs> due to the motion of the particle. which happens to occupy um, P at time t. Okay. 
So the two terms make individual and distinct contributions, right? So if um, you want to somehow decide not to move with the particle and remain at a specific point in space, you only experience the first term. So if x is fixed, this is what you experience. On the other hand, you can do, again, something that is somewhat unphysical. It's abstract. So there is a field of phi and the particle, and that field phi is changing with time, okay, increasing, decreasing point-wise, and the particle is moving through that field. All of a sudden, you take a snapshot of the field, and you freeze time. Okay? So in other words, you don't allow phi to move point-wise in time, okay? but somehow you allow the particle to move that through that picture, that snapshot. Okay? Now, because we're taking the time derivative, and because the particle is moving through the field, and the field is not a constant in space, it will still feel some rate of change. And that's what the second term is doing. Okay? So you freeze position, this is what you sense. If you freeze time in the sense that I described, you take a snapshot and allow the particle somehow miraculously to move through that snapshot, this is what the particle will feel. But in reality, both happen at the same time, so you have to take both of them into account. Okay? Um, so now, that's the idea, right? And now that was a scalar function. Well, let's do that for a vectorial function. In particular, we can do it for the uh, velocity. So we can go ahead and calculate the time rate of change of velocity, and that is what we understand to be acceleration. Okay. So the acceleration is the material time derivative of the velocity. So what I understand now is I can use the material representation, take a partial derivative with respect to time, or I can use the referential description, and I can use a partial derivative on v hat, or I can use the spatial representation, the v tilde representation, and go ahead and calculate first a partial derivative with respect to time, but then also take into account the convective part, which is going to be del v tilde del x operating on. Now, this is a tensor, right? Vector, vector, that's a second order tensor. It's going to operate on directly on the velocity, rate of change of x with respect to time. So that completes our absolute time derivative. Now, there appeared this new tensor all of a sudden. It's nothing but the spatial gradient of the velocity field, but this vector is this tensor is going to appear once in a while. We call it the um, velocity gradient tensor. Okay. Without too much creativity on the naming. Okay. Um, so uh, the velocity gradient tensor, on the other hand, is sometimes explicitly assigned two parts, and this is something we've seen before. Any tensor can be decomposed into its symmetric and skew symmetric parts. And for the velocity gradient tensor, these two parts have individual names and symbols. The symmetric part is indicated with D. The skew part is indicated with W. And the first one is called the stretching um, or rate of spin tensor. And this is the spin or the vorticity tensor, okay, for both cases. You don't necessarily have to remember the names, but the symbols are quite uh, commonly used. So the velocity gradient tensor is decomposed into D plus W. Okay? So those symbols I'm going to make use of in the future again. 
think we'll see examples later. Questions? No. Now, when I say this is the absolute time derivative, I think that's somewhat comforting to hear. Uh, when I put it into words, maybe it's a little bit confusing. Uh, so to sort of make you think a little bit more, I'm going to dwell on that, on those representations, a little bit more, okay? Just to highlight the differences, the nuances between them. Um, and I'd like to do that with a simple example. And at the same time, I'd like to extend it a tiny bit, tiny bit, okay? Okay, it's an example that I like, and uh, and I call this example temperature sensors and a fly. I've already sort of uh, given hints to the content of this example, but I'm going to denote these sensors with these symbols T, if you like, and. Uh, that's my fly, okay? So we have a room, and in this room, the, the fly will move, and the fly is going to sense a temperature change. And I'm interested, now why don't you not write for a while, and then you can complete it? It's not much anyway. Um, and what I'm interested in is, in is explicitly the temperature field that the fly experiences and how fast it changes, okay? So in this case, the fly would be my particle, and I'm interested in the material time derivative of the temperature with respect to the motion of this fly. In other words, uh, the fly is going to be my particle okay, that I'm trying to keep fixed. It can move in 3D. Let me denote the domain in 1D. So I have the domain, which is, let's say, the room, and that's my coordinate x. And the fly is moving through that room with some velocity, okay? And the velocity of the fly is v. That's the material uh, velocity of that point. And the fly experiences a physical value of the temperature, let's say, right? And that is phi, okay? So now, a very simple way to make sure that I measure the temperature change that the fly experiences, if I want to do that correctly, is to place a sensor right on the fly. Okay? So let me attach a sensor on the fly. And now this sensor is moving with the fly. So it sort of fits very nicely into the Lagrangian representation. So the sensor is keeping track of the fly exactly. So therefore, I'm going to call the velocity of that sensor VL, L for Lagrangian, but of course it's equal to V because it's moving with the fly. Now the sensor is going to send me a signal that depends on time because it's moving through the space, right? And that signal let me denote with phi hat. Why did I put a hat? Because it's naturally tracking the uh, fly and therefore it's essentially the Lagrangian representation. And therefore for that fly, at a given time, it gives me a signal. Now, that signal could be like this. So I'm entirely making up what these signals are, right? But eventually, I can read a signal in my computer screen. OK, that's one thing I can do. The other thing I can do is I can put a sensor distribution in this room everywhere, a dense distribution of temperature sensors like this. And these sensors are stationary. They're not moving in space. Okay. Um, and therefore, that's sort of a natural earlier representation. The sensors are fixed in space, and they are sending me data from that fixed point in space. And therefore, it nicely fits into this earlier representation. 
at any given point x, there is a sensor at a given time, it sends me a signal. I look at one of the signals, let's say, where the particle happens to be at a given time, it doesn't matter, and from one of those signals, I'm going to read off a input, okay? Now, the two lines will not be the same because this is the temperature uh, information that comes from the sensor on the fly, it moves through space, and this comes from at a given sen sensor, fixed sensor in space, right? So it's going to look different, so just to make it look different, I drew, I've drawn it like this, okay? Notice that, right, these are not equal to, I'm not writing this is equal, this is equal to the temperature at that given point, but this tracks the, uh, the, the fly and this does not, okay? So they look entirely different, okay? Um, phi is just the general representation. Now, something else I could do, well, actually at this point, let's stop and calculate the rate of change of the temperature that the fly is experiencing. So I know what it means, it's phi dot, it's d phi dt, right? And this is nice, it has a very uh, conceptual role. It reminds us what we're trying to do. I'm trying to calculate the rate of change of this field, keeping the fly fixed. Okay, now I want to do it in terms of the information that comes from the sensors, okay? And I want to use this red sensor. Well, the red sensor is already tracking the particle, so if I'd like to do it in terms of the input from the red sensor, all I need to do is take the partial time derivative of phi hat. And that's it. That's a precisely equal to phi dot, okay? Um, now, on the other hand, if I'd like to do it in terms of the information from the blue sensors, and remember, there isn't only one, but many, many blue sensors in space, okay? Now, if I'd like to calculate phi dot using the blue sensors, the particle happens to be at a particular location. At that location, the sensor that happens to be there is giving me a rate of change of the temperature with time, but that's not enough because the particle at a moment later is going to occupy a, is going to be on top of a different sensor and it senses somehow this temperature change it reflects that in the conceptual material time derivative, and if I want to reflect that in my calculation, I have to put in the gradient of the temperature field, which I can calculate from the sensor information. Okay? And therefore, I go ahead and take the gradient of the temperature field from the, temperature, uh, the sensor distribution and multiply it with the velocity. Okay? So far, so good. Now, what if I do something fancy and I allow the sensors to move? The sensor, there can be only one sensor that tracks the fly. There can be many, many fixed sensors. They are not moving. Or now what I can have is that the, the sensors They move with a velocity, let me call it ALE, that is not equal to zero, and it's not equal to V either. In other words, they are neither stationary nor moving with the particle, okay? So now if you would like to monitor the input from any one of these sensors, and there are many such sensors, right? One, two, et cetera. They are going to give me some information that I will call, let's say, uh, phi bar, okay? So any one of those sensors is going to give me a <coughs> different distribution or variation of the, the, the temperature with time. So now, suppose I'd like to calculate the time derivative of phi with respect to the green sensors. At a given time, the particle, the fly, happens to be over a green sensor. And so over that sensor, I can make use of the time rate of change of the temperature. Okay? And then I'd like to take into, the, the, take into account the fact that the fly is moving relatively 
in general with respect to these green sensors. Okay? And therefore, there is a mismatch between the velocity of the sensors and the velocity of the particle. Here, the sensor and fly velocity, they, there is no mismatch. Here, there is a perfect mismatch in the sense that difference is exactly v. Here, the difference is neither v nor zero. And so I'm going to go ahead and plug in the difference, the mismatch. Here I forgot a dot. The mismatch in the velocity between the sensors and that of the fly. Okay. Okay. So does it make sense? Well, we can check. If the velocity of the sensor is equal to the velocity of the fly, the green sensors are like the red sensor. This becomes zero, I fall back to the red, red, red representation. If the sensors are not moving, they have zero velocity, the green sensors are like the blue sensor, I fall back to that representation. But in general, the sensors can move independently from the fly, and therefore, um, there is an additional term here that is neither like this nor zero. But in the end, using any one of these sensor setups, you can actually calculate precisely what the rate of the temperature that the fly is ex experiencing is. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so that's the example, right? So this sort of puts together uh, different concepts and extends it a little bit. And now you notice that I have assigned an arbitrary velocity to the particle. It's neither Lagrangian or Eulerian. I'm sorry, the other way. Neither Lagrangian nor Eulerian. And this is called arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian, an arbitrary velocity somewhere in between the two. And arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian representations are important in continuum mechanics, especially when you want to do uh, uh, numerics that involve um, typically either only fluids or fluids and solids within the same domain. People typically revert to arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian representations. Okay. Um, that was just a very small, let me say, remark um, that helped perhaps clarify a little bit more these time derivatives, what we're talking about, but we're not going to dwell on the concept any longer. Okay, so now questions so far? So, so in practice, these different fields, these velocities coming through your, um, if, you, if you, you typically have some sort of a grid in numerical analysis, for instance, and then you have choices. Is the grid stationary in space? In fluids, typically it is. So it's like a full Eulerian <coughs> representation. So the, your sensors are like your, your grid, and the grid doesn't move, it's Eulerian. Or the grid deforms with the domain that you're trying to analyze. That's a very typical situation in solids. So it's fully Lagrangian. Or the grid can move independently of either one. It's neither stationary nor moving with the object. And that's a ALE grid. Okay? So that's how it comes in through, um, through practice, in practice. OK, anyways. Uh, we're not going to compute anything in this course. Um, that's a separate issue, a separate course. Let me give you, now that we talked about the material time derivative, I'd like to mention two particular types of motion. And the first one that's important is the rigid body motion. The rigid body motion is prob it's, well, not probably, um, I guess the only motion that is simultaneously very general, very useful, and can be explicitly written down. Okay? 
Remember that I have a motion function that maps the referential configuration to the spatial configuration. And that motion map in general is something that is complicated for deformable bodies, may not have an analytically, analytically expressible form, will require some numerical approximation. But for a rigid body motion, I know exactly how a rigid body can move. Because I know that the rigid body can at most go through some, right? Go through some rotation and translation. So if I take a proper orthogonal tensor, multiply it with the referential position, that contributes to rotation, plus I can translate the uh, position of the rigid body. OK, so I'm assuming here that Q is goes without saying proper um, orthogonal. Okay? So this is the rotation part. And this has to do with the translation. And now that we have the explicit representation of the motion, okay, so that is equal to, if you like, x chi of capital XT. Okay, that's the motion map. I can take the material time derivative that will give me the velocity and the only thing that depends on time in the first term, notice it's q, because the referential position does not depend on time, empathically, right? Does not depend on time. So it's q dot capital X plus c dot. In the first application topic, after we're done with part one of the course, when we move to part two, the first application is dynamics, where we're going to look at rigid body motion and um, its, let's say, implications. Uh, the second particular type of motion that is often useful and invoked in analysis is steady motion or steady flow, referring to the fact that typically you encounter this assumption in fluid mechanics. And what that means is it's an indirect reference. Steady is a reference to the time dependence. And what it means is that at a particular spatial location, the field that you're looking at is not going to depend on time. Okay, That's what steady means. Now it's strange, because although conceptually the referential representation is easier to imagine in a way, uh, well, at least depends on your field. I'm a solid mechanician, so I like it more. I use it more. Uh, but if you look here now, the, the referential description is more complex because the time dependence is still there. Okay? The definition of steady motion is at a given spatial location, there is no time dependence. Okay? But because particles move, at different positions, they can sense different fields. And therefore, for a given particle, as they move, and so they move in time as well, they will actually sense different values of V. And that's why there is still a time dependence. Let me give you a uh, simple example. All right, suppose you have a duct. And in this duct, there is a fluid. And the fluid is flowing. And I'm going to say that the flow is steady. Okay. So there is a well, the velocity in, inlet. Velocity is probably not a constant, but let's say it's a constant. So it's a small value here, and it's going to be a large value there. If I assume that this is some fluid like water, it's not compressible. right? The um, volume that comes in, rate of rate of volume of fluid that comes in has to be preserved, has to be equal to what goes out. So the velocity has to be larger at the outlet. So now, when I say that the motion is steady, it means when I go to a particular point in space at a spatial position, the velocity does not depend on time. So it's a constant. So here it's a constant. So it's small, it's increasing, but it's a constant at every point. But now, if I go ahead and put in a tracer particle into that flow, and it starts here, and it moves towards the outlet, it's going to initially experience a small velocity. And then towards the outlet, its velocity is going to increase. And that's why it actually, in the referential description, in other words, keeping the particle fixed, 
it experiences a time dependence. Okay? All right. So now, if you go ahead and calculate the uh, acceleration for the velocity, for instance, for acceleration for the particle, now, the velocity at any given point is not changing, but the acceleration is not zero, because obviously the particle starts with a small and ends up with a large velocity. And so this is not equal to zero. And well, what is it equal to? It's del V del T. Okay. This is equal to zero, but there is the additional convective term. It's del V tilde del X multiplying the velocity. Okay. And this second term, because of the fact that the velocity gradient is not equal to zero, the second term is not zero. <coughs> In general, of course, the flow is not steady. In general, it's unsteady. In other words, this spatial description also has a time dependence. Questions? <coughs> okay, so let me end up with what we're going to talk about um, next time. And perhaps I'll just squeeze in the concepts here. So we're talking about motion of a object. I'm assuming that the uh, motion map is a given. I know what the motion map is, right? Um, and therefore, I know precisely what every, where every point is moving to. Right? So this point, let's say, moves there. Okay? And there could be a point over here which could move here. Okay? So initially, the two points were far apart. And the motion took them close to one another. Or it could have been the reverse. They could have moved apart from each other. So then what's going to happen, as you can imagine, is that the body, if you draw a line on the body, this line is going to get longer or shorter. And not only does that happen, but also that line that connects these two things is going to also probably going to rotate. And if this line is long enough, then Perhaps the points move like this. It's going to even get a strange shape. It's not going to remain as a line anymore. If I had marked, if I had taken that object and I had drawn a small rectangle on its surface instead of a line somewhere in the body, that rectangle that I've drawn on the surface is also likewise going to deform because every point is going to move to a new location. And that patch of green is going to look different. Okay? Or somehow, if I could put some tracers within the volume and mark it with, let's say, a cube, that cube will grow larger or smaller. And if it's a large cube, let's say, it's going to deform into some strange shape. Okay? These are called line elements. Line elements can stretch, can rotate. 
These are called surface elements. The surface elements can stretch, change their shape. And also remember, on a surface, there is an outward unit normal. With deformation, the normal can also change. And these are called volume elements. In principle, they can change their shape, but primarily they will also change their volume. Okay, the volume can increase or decrease. So the question that we're going to try to answer next, next time is, if I know the motion map, can I calculate precisely how a line element is mapped from the referential to the current configuration, and likewise a surface and a volume element, how are they mapped? For instance, what is the change of volume of a volume element due to deformation? What is the rate of change of this volume, et cetera? And we're going to calculate all of those because eventually when we go into kinetics and we would like to talk about balance laws, we have to be able to evaluate these changes. We have to be able to calculate their time rate of change as well. And as you can imagine, when you talk about the change of shape or length or size, et cetera, this intrinsically also has to do with the concept of a strain, which you know from your undergraduate mechanics. So of course, then we're also going to talk about the concept of a strain, okay? And we're going to characterize uh, so-called strain tensors. Question? Okay, then. I'll see you next time.